ground control to Major Tom. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, okay, it's on, right? Good. Um, so yeah, I'm James Long. I work for this uh, company called Skybox Imaging. We make imaging satellites. Um, I got to go through a little bit of a primer so we're all kind of on the same page, and then we'll get into the case study kind of about, you know, flying satellites through browsers. So um, just kind of get us started off here. This there's things in here that the government likes to regulate that I can't necessarily go into topic about. Um, so uh, there's this, thing called, this organization called ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, and they have a lot of concern about things like guidance systems. Go figure. So um, there'll be some things around the talk that I can't necessarily go into exact detail on. You'll find that there's not like specific huge code chunks that might have things like spacecraft telemetry in it, things of that nature. Um, yeah, but uh, I think I will get the concepts across the, you know, from our case study here. Um, so basically Skybox, we process and take uh, satellite images, so we'll, we're kind of, you know, supposed to be this big data aerospace company, um, but we'll take, uh, you know, like a picture of a parking lot, count how many cars are, and then we can sell that information, for example, which could be pretty useful depending on who your competitor is, right? Um, there, we have licenses right now to launch two imaging satellites. Um, we're around 80 people, and we've raised about $100 million. So, yeah. So that's kind of a quick introduction to the company. Um, so let's get it started here. A little bit about satellites and telemetry and all that jazz. Our satellites are going to be in a low polar orbit, right? So basically this means you got the Earth floating up here, and the satellite's going to go all the way around, and it's rotating as it's going around, and it's taking pictures of the Earth as swaths kind of going around. You can see kind of in this photo. Um, low polar orbit, I mean, low Earth orbit puts us in around here. That's like no gravitational pull. That's like the moon. That's like GPS satellites. So we're right down in here. So you can kind of get an idea of where our satellites will be. Um, there's some caveats to this thing. Since the thing's always floating around, right, you don't always have rodeo contact with this thing, right? So they, we basically have this thing known as a communications cone, or a, it's like a window of time that you're allowed to talk to the satellite, because that's the only time that you can get a radio signal up through the atmosphere to go, hey, how you doing, SkySat-1? And um, so due to that, we have like these contact windows that could range from, you know, maybe 8 to 15 minutes, depending on what the weather is and stuff like that. So that kind of impacts how you write software, right? So keep that in mind. So telemetry. So this is what this whole dang thing is about, right? This is basically those bit streams, that data that comes down from the satellite and basically references some kind of sensor in the ground station or in the satellite itself. And that could be anything from like a temperature sensor to ohms of resistance. It could be to amperes. It basically tells us everything we need to understand about that satellite and there is a lot of them. I can't go into detail how many, but there's a lot, trust me. Uh, so important to remember. Now, when we're basically, so what, what happens is that as the satellite's floating around, and as we get into that communication code, uh, cone, the ground station and all the little dishes point up at it and go, hey, SkySat1, how you doing? And then they, they open up this bit stream, communication back and forth. This comes into basically a magical black box which is the ground station and an antenna array. You guys don't need to worry about that. At the end of the day, all you need to know is that this converts it into JSON. <laughs> so, yes. And then we can do whatever we want with it. Okay, and this is two-way, by the way. So this from the browser goes all the way up through. So think about that. Um, okay, so like I said, this is a case study. So basically, um, our first project at Skybox is basically building like some kind of user interface for purchasing satellite images. And then our product team comes up to us and goes, hey, hey, front end engineers, how you doing? Um, I need you to um, build mission control. I see. OK, um, interesting. So these images start popping up through your head, right? I mean, you got like 1960s NASA and the Apollo missions and Capcom on, you know, and all this other stuff kind of going on back and forth. And you got modern NASA with Mars and Hubble and all that stuff happening. And then, of course, David Bowie pops in your head, and you, all you can think is Major Tom to ground control. <laughs> but it really is serious business at the end of the day, right? So, um, and it's kind of an exciting opportunity because you think about it, right? I'm writing software that could work on my phone that controls a satellite in orbit. Okay, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, the first part of this project is basically, and which is what this case study is about, is basically building telemetry screens. So this is what you basically see in like those 1960s NASA photos of a bunch of people floating around a terminal screen, and it's got all these things coming up, and this is where the, like, the, uh, the mission operations manager, um, <clears throat> excuse me, mom, um, actually goes, you know, status check, and they're like, check, and they go back and forth, and okay, we can launch the rocket, press the big red button. Right, that's the kind of thing they're floating around. So they're monitoring those different aspects of the spacecraft or in the ground station to say everything's within tolerances and we're ready to go. And this goes as well for the communications of the satellite and you know, getting messages across. So it's very important that they have an easy way to access telemetry data that's extremely seamless to them, right? So we went about this, there's some you know, core requirements at the end of the day. We had to build a very strong prototype because Building mission control for an imaging satellite, you know, over a browser, not really been done before. So we'll use the prototype to help found our, some of our, fin finish off our product specifications. We'll also use it to test the type of software we're going to be using to write the darn thing, right? Um, and performance, the thing has to be fast. I, I shouldn't even have to go any more top uh, into that, I mean, it, given what it is, right? Time. I, you know, using the old uh, just uh, get time in JavaScript where it pulls off the client, not going to suffice. <laughs> um, apparently, they want the mission operations control system to have the same time as a satellite. How the heck do you do that? That was kind of interesting. Has to be reliable, obviously. If the thing breaks, um, not good. Um, so, and then of course, it needs to have a very quick and easy to use interface because they have an 8 to 15 minute window. If something happens during that 8 to 15 minute window and they need to change up what telemetry they're looking at, they have to be able to go in real quick, build up a new screen or get some new data in and then get that going in that same time slot. So it's very important that an operator can go in there and manage this quickly. And at the last but not least, and probably the most important, you have to test it. Oh man, yeah, yeah, so that one's fun. Okay, so getting started. So we started off with the dang prototype, right? A um, couple big things that we were testing for here, right? How much can the browser process when it comes to DOM manipulation? Because we have a lot of telemetry in there and there's a lot of things that get updated every second, right? So. We just wanted to see what we could handle there. The communications mechanism, how are we moving data back and forth between that magical black box and the browser? So, you know, this is like, you know, your comet versus web sockets versus magical browser smoke signals. Uh, I just invented that protocol, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, time management stuff, how do we handle that? Uh, we need to create some kind of real quick framework. Uh, we need to play with new HTML5 features. Um, so this is put in for my manager because he wanted HTML5 in there. Uh, and we need to pick a browser. Oh, well, isn't that awesome? <laughs> so we're building ground, ground control. We have the hardware. We get to specify what browser to use and what version. It, it, yeah, I just kind of giggly about that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so going on, so some lessons we learned with this prototype. Um, first of all, I, I, I get some responsibility for this horrible back ax, backwards design. So this is what the first prototype looked like. As you can see, it was hideous. Um, in fact, the uh, mission operations people, like the engineers, I would see them occasionally looking at me, doing one of these. And I was always afraid to start my car. <laughs> So um, we had to do something to correct it. But at the end of the day, honestly, the prototyping is one of the best ways to learn because we were able to test all this functionality. We learned before we actually started the real thing. We created a lot of throwaway code, but at the same instance, there was a lot of stuff that was reusable that came out of it. Totally worth the effort. Um, so talking about that prototype and performance, the things that we kind of learned. So the prototype originally just you know, keep in mind, prototype, was dynamically creating like 15,000 DOM objects on the fly, representing different aspects of telemetry. About 10% of that would be updated every 10 seconds. Well, damn. Um, so Firefox didn't hold out too long. Chrome did okay. Um, so what we did is we attached, uh, you know, a unique ID of those. ID lookups are supposed to be fast, et cetera. Um, so the lookup would take 3% of the CPU's time in Chrome. Uh, and then to update just the DOM value, we'd be looking at 2.5% of the CPU cycles. 
that's ridiculous. 5.5% of the time just updating the DOM? Come on, right? Um, some of the nodes, uh, yeah, shame to talk about this one. Um, so we, we had, um, there's some clocks on the page, right? Just to make sure they get the, they're always up to date, right? They, they let, it lets you know what the latest time is from the packet that we received. This is really good if you're a mission operations person because then you can see everything's in sync and working properly. Well, like an idiot, uh, I said, every single time we get a packet, update the DOM. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought my computer was going to fly. The Mac Pro CPU fans, very sturdy devices, I tell you. <laughs> um, Firefox crashed like that. Um, but uh, yeah, Chrome actually lasted in there a good five minutes. That kind of helped uh, kick it in for which browser we're using. Um, but uh, that quickly changed. Um, so what the heck do you do to kind of correct, you know, bad stuff like that. So first thing is, come to find out, you don't need a Gmail-like application when you're building telemetry screens, because you only have a few points you're really actually ever looking at. And if they want multiple screens, what they do is they just open up new tabs or new windows, and then they tile them together in those big-ass displays they have up at Mission Control. Well, awesome, cool. So I didn't have to display as much in the DOM. Next thing we did is, we shouldn't do the lookup each time. So we actually created a DOM reference object when the page is initially initted, which actually will pull all the reference to the related telemetry, store that in memory. And so that way, whenever you have to do an update, it's just a quick command, do an inner HTML. And so we went from like a 5.5% of the CPU cycles updating the DOM to 0 0.04. Not bad, not bad. So, um, yeah, so then the other thing with that crazy clock mechanism where it was making the machine fly, um, literally. Um, so basically, just do this very carefully. Um, so what you want to do is uh, interval. So you'll, you'll store that every single time that packet comes through. Yeah, update something in memory, but never display in the DOM. Put some kind of a timeout on it. Have it update every, you know, 100 milliseconds or something like that. They probably won't notice that in machine operations, right? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, moved over to CSS animations. So there was some JavaScript animations because they wanted things like if the data was stale to fade out. Makes sense, right? Um, so we moved over to CSS animations. That got us a huge performance hit. I mean, performance increase, excuse me. Um, the, we moved away from sprites and we base 6 and 4 coded all of our images and hard coded them into the CSS files. It's like sprites, but better. Um, so basically, there's some really great tools for doing that. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with that process. Um, so moving on here, back to performance. Oh, this is my favorite part of this. Um, so, so you're trying to think communications mechanism with the browser over some kind of uh, magical black box server. Um, how do you do that, right? What's in the course, you know, engineering management comes to you and says, this needs to be rock solid, reliable, and it needs to be implemented yesterday. What do you do, right? And so the first thing that comes up is rock solid, reliable, something that's tried and true. Obviously, it's Comet architecture. It's been around for ages. It's just native AJAX. It works, works in every browser. Debugging is easy because it's an AJAX call, right? It's not a whole lot to that. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, like I said, it's tried and true. The other thing that helps, and this is a big plus out to the jQuery folks out here, is that ActiveMQ, which is our part of our magical black box, um, actually had a built-in long pulling driver written in jQuery. So that was pretty quick to plug in. Um, yeah, just the common web model, so you're all familiar. Um, so basically, it sends out a request. There's a timeout in that. If it doesn't receive the request in, in that time period, it'll bounce and create a brand new request. And then when it receives an event within that timeout period, sends that data back to the front end. Front end will then instantiate a new AJAX request that goes back up to the server and waits. So what ends up happening is you get this middleware layer of just um, communications time back and forth. And uh, that, was, that was fun. Um, so this created some issues with us. Um, so the request for asynchronous, which is awesome. It's the nature of AJAX, of course, right? Go figure. So we had to have like architecture in place for like keeping sequence numbers, doing time checks on the packets to make sure things are of auto order. Because, um, you know, the operators might be a little ticked off if the batteries fluctuated. Yeah, things like that. Um, <laughs> So, um, and also created some serious latency in the request because you have the communication time back and forth and it's making the request back and forth, back and forth and reopening. It was a little bit rough. Um, the, the thing also was buffering back onto our middleware layer. So we actually had to have a pretty robust middleware layer with a lot of memory to handle the wait time. So you'd open up a connection, it would, it would open up a contact with a back end and it would say, okay, I'm waiting for you to send the next request, so the next, the next, uh, next AJAX request, so in the meantime, I gotta buffer this data so I don't lose it. 
and then I can send it to you when you open up your AJAX request back to us. So this is, um, when you start talking like 50 terminals connected, it was starting to add up and putting some serious stress on hardware. Um, one other thing that was just bizarre, ActiveMQ wrapped all their objects in XML for the AJAX request. So we had XML wrap JSON. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, and it was like, uh, we'd had to recompile the thing, of course it's in Java, so. Um, Firefox had huge memory issues, like when it was processing these large packet requests, so like the initial, when the satellite first makes contact, it goes, hey, Skies hit one, how you doing? And it would say, hey, here's a ton of data. And it would come down, and then Firefox would go, holy smokes, and then it would actually break the JSON parse. I don't know how to explain it. We tried to val a bunch of all other things. We'd actually get returned from that native function a half string, like it was, just messed up. Only in Firefox, um, WebKit worked fine. Um, so anyways, the parsing of all this, the AJAX request, all this stuff was taking up basically 8% 8, 8 of the CPU cycles on one satellite. What if you had contact with like two satellites? You can start seeing the issues here, right? So the developer stood up and said, no, we can't take it anymore, you're crazy. We need a sprint just to redo this and rethink it. And so we finally, we finally got that and oh, web sockets, thank you. Love you, WebSockets. It came into play. Um, so basically, it's a full duplex TCP IP connection. The handshake's done over port 80 or port 443, so you can do secure WebSockets. Um, might be important when you're maintaining spacecraft telemetry that it's secure, right? Um, okay, and uh, supported by all the major A-grade browsers, except for IE, of course. Um, and uh, IE, you can get to work with a flash hack. Uh, let's see here. It's got an easy set of methods and events. Uh, you can read up about it there. Um, just a quick example so you can see how the thing works. Open up a WebSocket, create a message, send the message, receive the message, close the connection. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we learned some lessons though with WebSockets that are kind of important to share because this is a case study. Remember, this isn't like a theory, WebSockets 101. This is real, real world stuff. Create a centralized event library for your WebSockets. This data needs to be accessible anywhere inside your application. Anytime you get data through, have it populate an event that's globally accessible. Very important. You don't want to repeat this. Um, let's see, Jetty 8, which we're using as our middleware. We're not using Node, I know, cringe. You can feel free, get it out of the way, cringe. Um, so Jetty 8 was what we were using. Um, part of the uh, issue with Jetty 8 is it actually time out after five minutes if it doesn't receive a message from the client. So this started up a, a, some kind of a, we had to figure out some way to keep these kind of connections open, also the browser didn't time out. So we started a two-way heartbeat. So like every second or so, the, the server would send a message to the client and say, hey, I'm alive, and I'm gonna send you some other important information that I'm gonna talk about later. And then we'd reply back and say, hi, server. And uh, so that was great. And uh, so we went from an 8% hit basically to something like a 6.6% hit just managing communications. So also a sizable difference. And uh, we don't need nearly the he as heavy of a middleware layer at this stage. So very cool stuff. I highly recommend WebSockets. Um, architecture, also very important, right? So we started off, of course, you know, because we're prototyping, we started off with this model where the modules are data independent, they can call anything they need, they can get access to anything they need. It seemed like a great idea at the time because they can go anywhere, do anything they want, you know, just kind of like two-year-old kids in Kmart. But um, this turned into a bad idea. Um, we end up getting this thing where things are calling similar data sets and they're doing funky things. They're all asking for different click events and it just became this giant soup. And it got really complicated when they came back and said, how the hell do you test that? And I was like, oh, oh, you're, you're kind of right. Um, so we switched that out to more of an event-driven architecture. So basically the modules and uh, so in the application level itself, we have standardized libraries for your timer, RESTful API calls, the web sockets, and then event delegation, which all happens at the page level actually, or can be attributed to module level depending on how heavy it is. Um, so anything that gets spawned out goes out to like an event dispatcher. I know it was talked about earlier that you shouldn't use your document. You can specify whatever you want for that event dispatcher, um, but document's what everybody's familiar with. Um, so once you get, uh, so basically any data that comes in gets broadcast out to this global scope, then anything else, any module can listen for that data and then do something with it, right? Which was a huge improvement because then all of a sudden things started working like unit tests. Like I could simulate clicks on things globally and it would work. I could, you know, 
process data, because all the data was driven by an event too, right? So I could false da falsify data in there. It was very cool. And then other applications could also tie in. So we basically dropped a ton of callback hell out of it, and it's been a huge performance improvement for us. Moving on to an event-driven model, so kind of more of a repeat of what we just talked about here. Drop the callbacks. Um, so, you know, um, any basically anything that's reusable on the page gets a standardized library, which then will rewrite back out to add a page-level event. So any module or any part of the application or even externally of the application, you have access to that data, um, which makes it, yeah, ridiculously easy. Uh, moving forward, uh, one thing that might be a little controversial is we moved away from a, uh, we moved over to a prototypal inheritance model from a, like a module pattern. Um, you can just see the, the specs on this. Um, if you haven't already, I suggest you do. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to go into more detail on that. Um, okay, managing time. How the heck do you sync SkySat 1 and my browser? It's not a magical get SkySat 1 time Native, DOM, native JavaScript function, apparently. Um, so what we did for that is, um, yeah, first thing, don't ever try to create your own timer. Just, just a bad idea. Um, it'll wander very quickly because of the processing time to actually increment. It's just a, it's stupid. Don't try it. Um, yeah, uh, so next part. So, well, then it's like, oh, it's obvious, right? Because the server time is already kept in sync through some other process. We'll pull the server time off, and then uh, when the page nets, we'll do that. We'll just pull that. So that's great, but then you can't always guarantee what the, the time is to execute the JavaScript on the page. The clock's actually inaccurate. So that kind of was like, hmm, what do we do with that? Oh, yeah, we put that heartbeat thing in, right? Just send the server time on with the heartbeat, and then we can use that to resync to completely synchronize our clocks across the front end. Well, sweet. It actually worked really well. So um, WebSockets and time. It's a marriage made in heaven. Um, and it's just some simple logic in the JavaScript that basically does a comparison with the internal JavaScript timer to figure out what the actual accurate time is. Um, and then you get a nice little, you know, QTC time down here that anybody can trust. One other thing that's um, important to think, too, is um, in our initial application, we had little set timeouts throughout the, S throughout the apps to make things fade in and out or to update, like, different monitoring tools and stuff like that. Uh, it was extremely jarring to the user watching things go... Like that, there's a bunch of camera flashes happening. So what we did is we created a global event uh, library. So basically every 500 milliseconds, it broadcast the time to the application and uh, also would um, act as a, a place for any module to tie into and set increments on. So you can say, like, I want this to happen in two seconds afterwards. Tie into that event, increment to, you know, four times, and then you got your timer. There's one set timeout for the entire app, which was pretty slick. Um, and then all of a sudden, all the modules across the page started working like that, very sync, very synced up. It, this was a very clean approach and also probably saved us a little bit on the memory footprint. Moving on, um, just um, reiterating basically some of the stuff we talked about here, um, reliability, the event-driven architecture got us a lot. WebSockets, of course. Uh, and then the one other thing I want to mention here, too, is that we want to provide um, proper user interface because at the end of the day, this has to be reliable, but it's probably going to fail. I mean, things like this do fail. Um, so we have things like red alerts in our application that let you know that something bad happened. And we're very specific and let you know, you know, the WebSocket connection failed. Or just proper error reporting has gotten us a huge, very far with that. Uh, okay, yeah, the dynamic interface. So this is that seamless interface that operations engineers will understand, learn, and love. Um, and of course, products want, goes, oh, this is the product manager's dream, and I'm sure you've all heard, I want drag and drop interfaces, and to be super dynamic, and yeah, I want iGoogle 3.8. Yes, okay, great. Um, so that's what they kind of came up with us, and you know, uh, we're like, cool, we can work with that, because we're using jQuery, right? So we utilize the UI library for things like drag and drop, uh, autocomplete, um, and external widgets like data table to show certain da certain things as well. Honestly, jQuery, we love you. Thank you so much. Uh, you made our lives so much easier in this regards. Um, one other thing, since they wanted a dynamic interface, um, well, we need to just kind of do a separation of your data and your view and stuff like that. So what we actually did is all those different telemetry screens are actually report back to a JSON object that's stored in the database. And uh, then that's 
used across the board for display purposes or updating or anything of that nature or editing it, it'll just update the same JSON object will get stored back to the database. Um, also makes it super quick for things like security, right? Because you can just say you just don't have access to certain objects. Um, and uh, the, one of the other things that we do with it too, with the WebSockets, is anytime that you like are working on a page and you edit something, it's real time saved. So it's like Google Docs, you know what I mean? So anytime you update or there's a change event fire, it just a new version off to the database and we have a complete change log of everything that's actually happened in the screen. Um, so that's kind of slick. Um, let's see, going forward here. Um, okay, now the fun stuff, the demo, right? So we went from this horrible, god-awful prototype to basically forming telemetry screens. This took a little bit of work to get you guys just to even see something because, yeah, the, all that ITAR restriction stuff. So if you're a mission operator, you're gonna come into this, the first thing you'll see is like some kind of a dashboard terminal. It's like, hey, what kind of screen do you want to monitor today? Oh, I think I want to monitor the ground station status. Oh, and then these are your telemetry points. Oh, crap. <laughs> yes. You're missing the special glasses that let you see anything. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> all right, well, I blame that on jQuery, of course, <laughs> that is their autocomplete, <laughs> so just teasing, um, so we did modify, obviously, the jQuery autocomplete here to do some fancy stuff, so it's really quick to, you know, ground, whatever, and so that's the ground station, of course, this is a quick, um, you can resize this guy, this should plus up, oh, oh, that's a little better, huh? Okay, so that's, uh, that's a telemetry screen. Of course, I can't get telemetry flowing back and forth here, but uh, I do have a playable demo for you. But first, uh, we'll move on to the, actually, you know what, I'll show you that first. Let me get the, pull the video over here. Okay, so you're in missions operations and you need to understand what the ground station's doing because you need to say, when do I have a contact so I can send data? So this is simulating a satellite contact with the ground station. We can't show satellite telemetry, but some ground station telemetry is considered okay to, to demo. So let's see if I can get this to blow up full screen here. And uh, let's see here. All right, so there's a little bit of a, so there should be a countdown here. It says uh, basically, is this in the right spot? It is not. Yeah, dang video. <laughs> All right, um, so basically what's happening is these, these uh, modules on the side here will light up and let you know when the ground station is about to receive contact and that syncs up and says, okay, I got contact. Now you have this along with the satellite and then things will start lighting up in here and say, hey, this is saying that we have an active connection and then the mission operator person goes, oh, hey, mom, it's okay to start sending commands now. We're good, we're good. And so that's, this is like a typical screen that they would sit around in that room and monitor. So you get an idea. It's uh, not quite as fancy as like the joystick or the PlayStation control I had hoped to originally build on top of, but uh, um, that's what Mission Operations likes, so. Yeah. Let's see here, moving on. And this is that seamless interface we were talking about. So of course with the help of jQuery, you get things like drag and drop. You can add new modules, and you can delete out things. And this makes it really easy for them to create a custom screen that monitors telemetry. So that's a lot of fun. So all right, back to the uh, demo in hand here. So last thing that's obviously the most important is how the heck do you test this thing? One of the things our engineers have built for us is that anything we recorded back from test beds or satellites that are kind of, um, is that we have a telemetry replay feature. So this basically what it allow us to do is um, force feed as much data from the spacecraft as we want through the WebSocket. Um, yeah, it's kind of the death knell actually. So you can say like, I want, you know, 100 days worth of data into the browser in five minutes. That's fun. <laughs> so it's very good for stress testing, for doing that kind of stuff. Um, the one other thing that's very that we, I don't think gets enough credit is Grease Monkey is a testing tool. 
So um, one of the things we do is we'll actually inject a Grease Monkey script which can simulate events inside to test the interface. So if there's telemetry that hasn't been, say, a new parts coming into the ground station and hasn't been installed yet, but we have to test the interface so it works out the door, we can actually generate that telemetry and then force feed it using Grease Monkey script into the browser to simulate the interface. So um, that's been a huge help for us, and our QA actually loves that. Q unit test on any of the major libraries, uh, G unit test on any of the pipeline stuff that's happening on, Selenium, of course, for spot checks on the interface, great QA that understand user interfaces is a huge plus, and then standard release plans. This is all standard stuff that you guys are used to. So in conclusion, remember, web sockets are greater than all. Um, if your manager ever comes to you and suggests long pulling, we have a 1-800 number that we came up with to take them out and make them an offer they can't refuse. Um, yeah, uh, utilize standard libraries, event-driven architecture, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, at the, yeah, time is also vitally important, keeping those things in sync, and DOM management. So again, reducing as much lookups to the DOM and as much input to the DOM as possible. So any questions, you know, feel free to hit me up.